and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guest, well, she co-founded Choose Love. She's been on our airwaves for a very long time on Radio X. And, well, she's an author and she's got a brand new, her debut children's book coming out very, very soon. She's going to tell us all about it. She's mum to two. It's Leanna Bird. But it's actually Rihanna, as I've just found out. <laughs> my strange Welsh spelling that my dad decided on, which has confused everyone I've ever met since then. So thanks for that, Dad. But, but your dad is Welsh, I'm guessing. My dad is Welsh, although he doesn't sound in, he doesn't sound Welsh. He sort of got rid of his accent when he was about 18, I think. But he spelt it with double L, so it's like Lloyd's Bang, Rihanna Bird. But yeah, confusing everyone ever I go. So that's why everyone calls me Birdie because it's much simpler. Much easier. I mean, I love that we would, would all do that. Anyone that's got a slightly different, like different name, just give them something that they can say. That's Absolutely. that's all we need. That's how friendships are made. <laughs> the birdie, birdie. There we go. Nice and simple. Hello. How are you feeling? I am good. I'm really happy to be here. It's, Thank you. It's such a pleasure. I was saying it's been a while since I've been on mic. I took a pause from broadcasting about a year and a half ago, and um, it's 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 so weird because I was like, what do I do? Where do I put the cans? Have You've got the mic? no buttons in <laughs> no front of you or fade. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just press the table every now and then. <laughs> Something might it's happen. like riding a bike and I haven't forgotten how to talk. So that's all we need, isn't it? <laughs> I, I feel like even though you're not on the radio, you have been talking every day since you left. So it's all I fine. I know, they can't shut me up. <laughs> Never stop speaking. <laughs> but is there, do you miss it in the, in the sense that I think when you're, when you're on radio and you are, you know, you're out and you're talking in that way with other adults and you're interacting, it's very different when you are at home. Oh, gosh, yes. I, 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 lo- I had, you know, I thought it was the best job in the world and I loved it and working on you know initially XFM it was my dream radio station Mm. I grew up listening to it so it was such a dream being there and I loved the job and it was fantastic but the lifestyle became not conducive with my family life yeah. and with what I wanted to do it was the you know having to be in the studio every weekend Saturday and Sunday is fantastic look it, it freed me up in the week to do other stuff which is mm-hmm. brilliant to be with the kids during the week but I missed so many birthdays so many weddings so many christenings so many moments with my friends and I was prepared to do that and when it came my kids came along I was yeah. like oh I don't know if I can miss those moments with my kids not that they're about to get married or anything <laughs> but you know those weekend moments that you're creating those memories as a family yeah um, with your friends and their kids as well. That was that was something so important to me and I just felt like I needed to take a break from that and just step away and do other things that allow me that freedom to sort yeah. of really enjoy them while they were small. Yeah, and how has it been? It's been a ride. <laughs> I love that. It's been a ride. No, listen, I I wanted to be a mum, honestly, since I was so small. I used to pretend that I was ill on holidays so that I could stay home and look after the kids in the little creche in the hotels we were in, the little two years, because I was so obsessed with little kids. So I'd been dreaming about it, and I was so panicked that it might never happen to me. I was so worried about it. And when I had my kids, you know, my first daughter came along. I was 36, and I was just, you know, so happy to have her. And then the reality of what it is is so different to what you imagine. Yeah. So I have, I, I'm like, you know, in many ways living my dream, but I think the reality of the kind of domestic side of it that comes along is is a bit of a shock to the system. Yeah. I think like the the mumming part of it is amazing. You know, the, the hanging out with your kids and, and spending time with them and being in that magical, strange children world that, you know, the, the funny things they talk about and say and do is just magical. But all the kind of, the the domestic stuff, the laundry, the washing, the yeah. cleaning up after them, and also the logistics. I'm so unorganised. I can't honestly. I haven't been to the dentist myself for like five years, and suddenly you're responsible for like the admin of these little people <laughs> and like where they're going and how they're getting there and the health and, and well being of them. And it's it that's quite overwhelming. And yeah. I'm I'm like in a really lucky position as well. You know, I I can get some help. I've got a great partner, so. I, I empathise with people who are like, you know, doing it on their own. And I know I'm really lucky, but I, I did find that side of it. I hadn't really thought about that, I think, yeah. before I had kids. I just thought it was all going to be trips to the zoo and <laughs> to the seaside. And- I don't mean, I don't know what it's like in your house, but I find that my day with the kids is very different to a Tom day with the kids if one of us is away. You know, I spend so much of the day 
doing the dishes, doing the washing, doing all that stuff. Whereas I'll come home if he's had them and it's everything is an absolute mess, but they have had the best day ever. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're quite lucky, I suppose, probably like you and Tom in a way, we, we kind of have to take turns a bit yeah. in terms of who's more present at home and who's working. But my partner's work, you know, he, he's been really full on like the last seven months. He's basically been filming three shows back to back and it's been a lot. And I suppose like even when I'm working and when I'm away, I still feel like the CEO of the family. <laughs> so like, even if I'm not there and he's there and he's doing it and he's, you know, absolutely acing it as a dad, I'm still like managing it. So <laughs> it's that side of things that, and I, my brain is not, doesn't work like that anyway, but I'm like, okay, the logistics of how they're getting to school and who's picking up the nursery and like just the little, that, that side of things. I don't think you ever shut off or yeah. certainly I've taken on that role. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking about it the other day on Instagram and, and loads of women were messaging me about this, about how like this role of just a mum actually encompasses so many jobs. Yeah. And I think the CEO of the family is quite, is quite <laughs> a good way to describe it. But you are like, in many cases, like the chef, the chauffeur, the admin, the PA, the medic, like all these different the therapists. <laughs> and it's like, it, it, it can be, it can be, you know, such an all encompassing job. And then to try and balance that with other things, if you've got other aspirations and ambitions, or even yeah. just to just like be yourself and hang out with your friends, just to, have that side of you as well it's um it's a challenge even for someone in a life position like me on the whole time like yeah. you're constantly thinking about you know what's happened before what's happening now what's going to happen next like you, you there's so many things that need to be you need to be juggling just the parent side yeah it's funny because i i spent 16 years doing music radio and you know blasting music into my ears and you know quite full-on <laughs> music in some cases and loving it and djing around the world you know yeah. i've been in festivals and just playing the loudest music and getting the crowds going and my partner said to me the other day, he was like, y you can't listen to loud music anymore, can you? And I was like, I just, I can't because I'm so like overwhelmed. The kids are asking me for things and talking to me that when there's like Nirvana playing or something in the background or, you know, just something a bit heavier and a bit more full on that's distracting. Like I just, my brain's like going, I can't, I can't listen to my children and do this and have the music. Yeah. So it's like I've sort of shut down and I need to have quiet and calm to deal with being a parent. Yeah, but it's just another noise. It's another thing grabbing your attention. I like it with the washing machine. <laughs> Honestly, I have to shut the door so I can't hear the washing machine because it feels like it's just that one sound too many. Yeah. So I need to shut it it's out. It's the overstimulation. And it's funny because I'm, I'm a person that only gets things done when there's a lot going on. Mm. So I can't write unless there's like noise and distraction of people. I have to have someone to sit with me in order to like, you know, wipe a surface. I can't do it if I'm on my own because it feels like homework. But if someone sat with me, I'll like reorganize my cupboards, write an essay, like do whatever I need to do. But I have to have people around me. So it's quite weird that I now have to have this like quiet moment. It's quite a contradiction. <laughs> but yeah, there we go. We're all a bit of contradiction, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, we are. But I, I feel like there aren't that many moments of stillness as as parents you know even when you're trying to put the kids to bed it doesn't feel very still yeah and the naps like I remember when um when my my youngest my oldest one sorry was um was a baby and she you know you've got all the different naps god the naps I feel like traumatized even saying the word naps because <laughs> I became obsessed with like the nap schedule in my house but um, I remember when she was napping and everyone was like sleep when the baby sleeps you must <laughs> sleep too and I was like yeah that'd be really great but my mind is going at a thousand miles an hour and I have to do this and that and this and that and, like and you're trying to like get everything done and I remember people saying to me well why don't you just sleep and other than the fact that my brain was kind of on overdrive it was also like well this is my only moment to do something yeah. that I might like even if that is watching some you know reality tv or texting your mates or whatever it's just a moment when you belong to yourself so it's also <laughs> why we stretch out that time after the kids go to bed because it yeah. feels like yours and I mean I'm really guilty of staying up later watching an extra episode of inside number nine or succession or whatever it is just that you just end up going yeah, I feel to like these are late. good choices though I'm like watching millions of episodes of like selling sunset like <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I can't cope with anything that I have to think for. I watched a doc, like a kids documentary on butterflies that my five year old wanted to watch the other day, and I was like, I think this is the most intelligent TV I've watched in a really long time, and it was her choice. So um, yeah, but it is that it is that um, you should be going to bed because you know you're exhausted and you have to go up in the morning, but you just want to have yeah. adult time. But even then, that's like zombie TV. Let it come in, let it wash over you. You know, just it's it's easy, easy yeah. access. I know. I discovered reels about. 
I, I know I'm really late to the party. I'm going to sound like a granny here, but I didn't know about the whole like flicking reels thing. Yeah. And I discovered it. And then like I spent about a week just staying up in bed <laughs> watching all these like videos. And then I was like, what am I doing? And I actually made a pact with myself three days ago. Yeah. And this is, I was with my two best friends from school and they've been my best friends for like decades. And they were talking about all the books they've been reading. And I was sitting there listening to them and I was like, I don't think I like have that much time at the moment to read books. And they were like, you do, you just... You're just looking at your phone at bedtime, aren't you? And I was like, I am. So I've made a pack now that I'm reading to go to sleep. That's and so, so good. I, it's only been three days. And but... how is it going? How far into that book are I'm you? I'm loving it. I, it's a book I've had since January that it's like taken me till now to read half of it. I'm one of those people that you go on holiday and you get through like four books in a week. Yeah. But in real, in your real everyday life, you just get distracted and, you know, there's there's kids, there's phones, there's TV, there's all the rest of it. And I was such an avid reader when I was younger. So yeah. getting back to that in the last three days <laughs> well, it's been a life-changing experience these last three days of mine well um, I do something now where I download the audio of the book and I have the book so I'll, if I'm on like the school run on the way back I'll listen to some of the books so I feel like I've read some move. Mm. I feel like that's something I would say I would do and then I'll just listen to trash <laughs> I thought I would listen um, learn Spanish you know or, like become like fluent at Spanish on the school runs just not happening I'm just <laughs> singing along to the greatest <laughs> I love that. <laughs> what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? I had a really lovely childhood. I, I was very lucky. I, I grew up um, in London. Yeah. So in West London, kind of around Labbock Grove area. And then we moved a bit more west. Um, and my mum was originally a social worker. Mm -hmm. I thought she didn't work when I was little. And I remember saying to her like, yeah, no, 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 because you were a stay-at-home mum when we were little. This was just the other day. And she was like, no, no, I worked. And I was like, oh, I <laughs> remember her being so present. But I think that's a testament to her because when she was around, she was obviously so present. Yeah. And she said, no, I did. I, she did half days. So right. she was around a lot. And um, my dad was an architect, um, a Welsh architect. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we. I had an older sister. I still have an older sister. Um, a dog, cats. We had a really, really lovely, lucky childhood. And we spent half of the time in Devon. Mm -hmm. So we'd go down where my How dad's... How comes Devon? Well, my dad's best friend um, ha lived in Devon and they had like, you know, four kids. It was very wild. And, you know, there was like chickens running everywhere and the kids would just kind of we just sort of be naked and running around and just kind of climbing trees and you know it was all that kind of vibe and it was amazing I loved it I I, I found it such a kind of a altering experience that I don't think I really realized until now yeah and now when I go out with my kids you know to the parks and to the heath and I feel like that, that kind of memory that childhood memory is creeping back yeah so I think I was I was really really lucky um we, and to have that split as well between being Devon and a bit wild to yeah. living in London where it would have been. It was a good balance. Um, and then my parents separated when I was in my teens. Mm. But I think I was probably had had enough of a time with them in a way to not be too traumatised yeah. by it. I mean, so many so many people grow up in, in families where the parents aren't together. But obviously it does have an effect on a child. So yeah. I, But I, 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 it was okay. And I think now... I look back at it with a very different viewpoint to at the time, which is that my parents must stay together mm. no matter what. And now I go, they're, they're much happier with their partners now. And yeah. it's all, it's all well, okay. We had films like Parent Trap and stuff where, you know, <laughs> children were trying to get their parents back together. Yeah. You know, that's what we were told. I was definitely to... full on Parent Trap. Me and my <laughs> sister were like full on in that zone of session. But now we look back and we go like, no, it was the, it was the right thing at the time. But, you know, I, I think, like I said, I, I had that kind of time with this very sort of idyllic childhood before before it will happen so um I feel I feel quite lucky really. yeah yeah and did you look ahead to you growing up and and having a family of your own yeah absolutely I mean my mum so my mum started as a social worker as I said then she became a potter and she was an artist so our childhood was so a pot, a pot, potter yeah oh. I she's, didn't know that was the term for it. Yeah. Potter, she's not just like lit really into she's Harry not, Potter. Well, she doesn't just, pot around the house. <laughs> she's a full-time potterer. She, yeah, so she 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 sort of had a second career um, and started, she did like a city and guild course yeah. and started making these very beautiful sculptural pots. What an amazing thing as a child, though, to see your mum kind of go, actually, I've got this, although you didn't realise she worked, but to kind of go... <laughs> <laughs> My mum suddenly went, no, no, she's just changed her career. Yeah, no, she, she was so creative. She is so 
so creative still. And she, so she gave us this really magical childhood. Yeah. You know, she used to put on these plays with me and all my friends and she'd make all the costumes and all the sets <laughs> and she'd write the scripts. And we had this really magical artistic childhood. So I think I was so desperate to have that again with my own kids. Yeah. And so much of the stuff you get to do with kids is the weird crafty arty stuff that they mm -hmm. just absolutely gobble up. So um, I was really yeah, really excited. I think my mum really sort of instilled that into me. And like I said, when we used to go on holidays and I used to pretend to feel sick so that I could stay and <laughs> babysit the little kids that were left at the hospital, in the hotel crash. So obviously, yeah, I was I was wait I was just waiting. But I also think because I had them it wasn't too late, but thirty six isn't early. And I think I'd Did you have a number in your mind? I definitely think I, I wanted to have them earlier than that. Um but I'm actually with hindsight really glad because it wasn't it wasn't like I mean although I was a geriatric mum on the form. It's, it's so ridiculous, awful. isn't it's it? So awful. I know. When you see it, you're 36 and they're like, okay, so you're a geriatric mum and you're like, oh gosh. But um I I felt like if I'd have done it earlier, I wouldn't have done all these things that I wanted to do in my life, which allowed me to I'm gonna use my friend's expression here, but let myself off the hook for the first year of motherhood. Yeah. So a friend of mine, Dawn, said to me when I was pregnant, she said, you know, one piece of advice I'm going to give you is to, for your first year, let yourself off the hook. Like, mm. just allow yourself to not feel you have to keep up with everyone and everything and do what you, feels good for you. And, you know, learn from... She, she'd she been so busy in her first year and she was like, just learn from me and just take it at your own pace. And I think... I did that partly because of her advice um, and partly because it felt right, but also because I was at an age where I'd done, I'd ticked some boxes for myself, yeah. which allowed me to feel like I could do that. And I think, you know, whatever age you are, you should be able to let yourself off the hook, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, especially, you know, not, not everyone can take time off work, but if you can and you want to, um, to allow yourself to do that. But I think we have so much pressure on ourselves to you know, to, to do it all mm -hmm. and to keep up with things and to not um, get left behind. Yeah. Um, and so I'm glad I waited a little bit because I think, I think it, it gave it, it for me personally felt like, okay, it's okay to take a pause and it's okay if I'm not climbing that career ladder and doing what, all these things. Do you things. feel like that was a part of your sort of decision to to wait was that kind of wait because you just don't know what's going to happen especially in the entertainment industry you know how things shift and move and there's new voices and yeah I mean I had I had a bit of a wild ride just before I had my first daughter Dali I so I was working on radio and then I got um I was doing podcasting as well and our podcast got picked up by a public publisher who wants to make it into a book so I got commissioned to write 90,000 words in four months which <laughs> as I'm sure you know it's quite the task and just after I signed the contract for that um we started Choose Love at the time it was called Help Refugees and we initially intended it to be a kind of couple of weeks of just fundraising and it just steamrolled into something so incredible and so big and we had so much support coming in it was really overwhelming and we felt like we couldn't get off this ride because we had this opportunity to really help yeah. and to really channel this wave of support that the public wanted to give and they needed a way to do it. And so we, we, we sort of ran with that and it became all encompassing. So I was mm -hmm. doing, I was doing the charity, the radio on the weekends and the book, and I was just working, you know, all hours basically. And I didn't have days off and that carried on for nearly a year mm -hmm. and then I got really sick so my body just like I started waking up in the morning covered in hives no and initially I was like oh I'm allergic to the washing powder or yeah. there's something and it kept on happening and then I woke up one morning and <laughs> I was going about my day and my face blew up I don't know if you've ever seen anyone with a peanut allergy but you know their face is just yeah. I mean it's like unbelievable like my lips were huge my eyes were huge and I just I looked completely different and so I went to the doctors and they didn't know what was wrong. And eventually they discovered it was an autoimmune condition. And the doctor just said to me, you're like, you've got to reduce the stress in your life. You're never going to get pregnant if you, because he knew I was trying for a baby. And he was like, you're, it's never going to happen. Like your body is in distress, basically. Mm. And so I had a sort of really difficult moment where it was like this, these things I'd built and this work I was doing yeah. that I loved and these, you know, the career side of things and the, and I could see with Choose Love as well, you know, how, how much good it was doing. But then on the other hand, I really wanted to have kids. So it, I, I decided in the end to take a step back and mm. pause 
and give myself a break. And everyone was so supportive about it. But it is really hard when you have to, you know, sometimes make these decisions. I think, you know, everyone talks about, you know, can you have it all? And I think you probably can have it all, but maybe not always at the same time. Mm. So sometimes you do need to separate things out. And it's really hard to take the break off one thing to allow the other thing to blossom. It's quite a challenge mentally to do that. Um, so I think that was my challenge. I love that way of looking at it, though. You probably mm. can, but a different time. Because I think actually having it all at one time, that's really overwhelming. How do you enjoy everything when yeah. you have it all at once? And I think some people, you know, some everyone's in a different position, mm. you know, financially and in terms of their support. And so some people, you know, are lucky enough to be able to make a choice and they can choose either they want to go back to work really early and throw themselves back into work. And, and that's great and valid. Yeah. Or they really want to stay home and just really soak up being with kids that's great and valid but when you're trying to do both it can I'm some people must be amazing at it because you Mm. see them doing it and they're just nailing it and acing it but it it I can find for me anyway I end up not being good at either yeah (laughs) or feeling guilty when I'm doing either so for me I felt like I needed to try and separate them out and just have like time to do one and then slowly rebuild and my kids are getting to an age now you know they're two and five and things life feels a bit calmer yeah (laughs) suddenly um so I feel like I can be focused a little bit more on myself again and pushing that kind of side of things um a bit more and health wise when you did decide to take a step back how long did it take for you to to feel like you were you know back to you it was I mean it was part of a you know there was a lot of different things I had to do to get well so on the one hand I had to really take my foot off the pedal with work especially the charity work was really stressful, yeah. as, as you can imagine, because we were dealing with some very difficult situations and some people in, in really deep distress as well. So that was quite hard. And it was very, because we were a startup as well, you know, we didn't have the necessarily the systems and the structures yeah. that are in place today to support that. So I had to take my foot off a lot of that. Um, and then eating healthily, trying to sleep, meditate. I found meditating so hard. <laughs> I mean, Bernie, we've been in this room for like 20 minutes and I could already tell you, you have so much going on. Frantic head. <laughs> I, my friend, one of my really good friends took me to a gong bath once. He's like, come to the sound bath. We're going to like bathe in the gongs. I've never been more miserable. I lay there for an hour just lying on the floor going, when can I get up? When can I stand up? <laughs> yeah. Um, so meditation was a challenge. But I used to do the Headspace app every right. day. It's good. I think the more frantic you are, the more you probably can benefit from yeah, it. It's the more just you need it. Your body's resisting it. Um, yeah. So that, and then also, I I found a, a really amazing doctor. I went down a bit of a um, rabbit hole on the internet to find a person that understood about mast cells and about histamine and the specific kind of disorder I had. Um, and he just went, "You need you need steroids, and you need to be on heavy steroids, and then we're going to wean you off." And yeah, I've, I've been symptomless since then. So it's amazing. It is amazing, but it was also a real wake up call that unless you have the resources and the finances, sometimes to advocate for yourself yeah. medically, you can get left behind. And mm-hmm. I feel so lucky that I knew how to, and I had the time and the resources to dig around in the internet and find this specialist, mm-hmm. and then also had the financial means to pay for him yeah so um you know I I, it was a bit of a wake-up call about how other people navigate these kinds of circumstances in very different ways Mm. and I felt really really lucky that after I think it was about a year of it that I was able to basically get better completely so and have and get pregnant and have babies but I mean (laughs) with that though because if you were already trying you know did you have to take the the foot off in that respect to get yourself well before probably should have but no I was like (laughs) I'm like obsessive so like when I was like right I've decided I want to have a baby it was like nothing would push me off that path I'm like really steaming yeah and like you know my partner and the doctors everyone were like why don't you just get well first and I was like nope I am. And I almost made getting well like a job. So I was like up late at night reading research papers and finding scientific and find scientific kind of research around it and reading about every probiotic and just really obsessive. Yeah. And um, starting to say, talking to you, going like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> this is like my therapy now. <laughs> <laughs> all coming out I'm glad we can um, help <laughs> but yeah I, I I, couldn't get steered away from the path of I will have a baby this is what I want to do right now and this is what we're going to do and I was very determined mm. um, I just I just felt it was the right time and I was really scared that if I left it later it wouldn't happen yeah um, I just think so many 
people probably have that fear in the back of their heads. Yeah. And, and, you know, since the age of 30, I remember thinking, like, what if it won't happen to me? Yeah. And panicking. But also, I think we spend so much of our life with parents going, don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant, yeah. don't get pregnant. <laughs> or then you take that on yourself, don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant. So then when you do suddenly go, well, actually, now I want to get pregnant, can it actually happen? Because yeah. I've been saying no for so long. I know. And they never tell you at school, you know, that actually for some people it's a challenge mm. and it's not always that easy. And when you start looking at the odds of it, you know, and the <laughs> yeah. odds of even me and you being alive, you're like, wow, that's that's <laughs> like so far out like that we're even here. When you look at the kind of odds of all the things that have to happen to create a life yeah it is kind of magical really can you remember finding out you were pregnant the first time do you know i'm thinking back now i think i was in shock actually really? i think i was in shock i think i really really didn't think it was going to happen because i because of what happened with being so unwell i didn't think it would happen so soon and i didn't think i just was so didn't really know how to react and i was i was kind of scared of it not working out as yeah. well so i was scared to be too happy mm -hmm. um so I was really like tentatively happy at the beginning and then you know as it goes on and you go for the checks and you get the scans yeah. and eventually you're like okay this is actually happening and then I was just yeah and then I was in heaven <laughs> because I didn't know what was in store around the corner <laughs> I was in my ignorance bliss. <laughs> I actually was so afraid of giving birth. I focused on that. Yeah, I don't know why. And I, I was, I mean, I know why, because we talk about it so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so worried about that, that I didn't really think about the part after. Well, I don't think anyone <laughs> does. I think it's like getting married. All people focus on is the wedding day. You know, it's the wedding day or it's the giving birth. No one else ever thinks beyond that and what that what and, that means and what I think is funny about the whole birth thing as well is because you plan and you plan and you think about all this like how do I want it and what do I want and then it comes to it and everything goes out the window for me anyway I had done all this like hypnotherapy and you know get my tens machine and I was all like mother earth and then it came to the contractions and I was like I just want to throw the tens machine across the room and watch <laughs> Queer Eye <laughs> and that is what I'm going to do. I need to watch reality TV. And I basically watched Queer Eye for about 10 hours. Did during you? During my first labour. Yeah, that's what I did. I, I went into labour. We My partner and I were going to bed. It was 11 o'clock. So he was asleep. And I had a contraction. And I was like, I got this. I'm going to be fine. I'm just going to wake him up. Him up. In a few hours yeah, like when it. things, you know, they <laughs> talk about the timing and not to go too early. So I was like, I'm just going to watch Queer Eye. I'm going to throw my tens machine away. I'm going to watch Queer Eye. And I just sat there and watched it. And then after about six hours of me watching it, <laughs> Noel came in and he was like, why are you mooing? <laughs> and what are you doing? And I was just sat there with my la laptop kind of making very loud mooing noises. And he was like, what is happening? We have to go to the hospital. I was like, no, it's a really good episode. Tan has just told them that they found this amazing outfit. And he was like, okay, put the laptop down. We're getting a taxi. We're going to the hospital. And I was like, can we bring the laptop, please? And he was like, we can bring the laptop. So we brought well, the laptop. Well, tell your phone. It's okay. Can you come on. <laughs> we brought it. We did bring it. And it was with us through the entire... So birth. had you done hypnobirthing leading up to that? I had tried it and I you know I think it's amazing and I think people who do hypnobirthing um are incredible. I wish I was I wish I was the person who liked the gong baths and did the hypnobirthing. But I would say even in that six hours <laughs> of just watching Queer Right, you filled your, you know, your brain with something that made you happy. I don't know if reality TV and hypnobirthing are exactly I the would same. Say, I, like, I like the way you're reframing it. <laughs> More power to you. I actually, I had the pleasure of meeting Tan oh, yeah. oh, some years you? later and I was like, you were with me when I had my first baby. And he was like, oh, wow, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, I say the same thing about my life. McIntyre. I've not met him yet, but that that would be an interesting conversation. Was he with you during? Like, well, was he, were yeah, you listening? I, was, I was watching it. Yeah, you're watching. He, yeah. yeah. Okay. So me and you both needed the visual distraction. A bit of funny, a bit of humour. Yeah, I found the hypnobirthing lady's voice. I just like when I was in pain and listening to her being like, you know, soothe away the pain. I just, I really <laughs> wanted to hit her. I sounds really awful. I was just like, <laughs> she's really, really annoying me now. Just stop telling me that it doesn't hurt. It really, really hurts. And But Tan and Jonathan and all the gang, Bobby, they they all just made it all seem okay. So. <laughs> like they do. That's what they do with I life. Like I shouldn't have advocated violence against hypnotherapy <laughs> tape audio no, book ladies. It's like but... my watch tells me to breathe. Just take a moment. I'm like, fuck off. Because it's always in moments that I'm actually, 
like stuff's going on. I don't yeah. need to take a breath right now. Actually, <laughs> I'm feeling the frustration. I'm going to take it out on you. Um, so how was it when you actually got to hospital? I I was really lucky. I had a really lovely obstetrician. She is actually um, the boss of my school friend, who is also an obstetrician. Ah. So I felt really, really spoiled and really looked after. I had to be induced because my waters broke too early. So the kind of plan went a bit out the window and I was watching Queer Eye and I was having my contractions and I was really convinced that I I was like, I don't know why now I look back at it. I'm like, why didn't I just go straight for the painkillers? But I was convinced that I didn't need it. Yeah. And then they induced me and the pain goes of the contractions, which I felt was manageable goes for suddenly from 0 to 100 yeah. because they have to bring it on really fast. And I remember I was just screaming, like, give me the epidural. <laughs> so and I got the epidural, and for me it was heavenly. And I was like, why didn't I just do this in the first place? So with my second child, when they were like, let's talk about the plan, I was like, the plan is the epidural, and that is it. And they were like, can you make I was like, no, I, I, I just want that. And some TV. <laughs> it was Mrs. Maisel for my second daughter. That's what I watched. Oh, I've <laughs> never seen that. Yeah, that was my birth plan, TV. And epidural, done. <laughs> um, and I'm out. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? I think it's such a personal thing. Like some people want the hearing birth thing, they want all of that. And actually, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anyone wants. It's just in that moment, your baby coming out and you both being happy and safe. Absolutely. And I remember thinking, you know what, that you, you when you're pregnant and you start getting fed all these sort of stories and facts about like what's best for baby and what's the you know what you know if you can do it this way then you know you're a champion and you feel like you you have to do things a certain way in order to have succeeded Mm. and actually I remember my obstetrician said to me she said you know what if a baby comes into the world and the mom is in a good place and not necessarily in pain, you know, and is happy and able to cuddle that baby, then that's great as well, you know. Yeah, yeah like more power. If you can do it without painkillers and you can do it natural and all the rest, that is amazing. But if you need painkillers and you, you bring the child into birth and you're calm because of that and relaxed, that's, there's also benefits to that. Yeah. So I think, again, it was that whole thing of letting yourself off the hook. And I'm really lucky I had a great obstetrician who kind of mentally like was like can you just stop listening to all these books and voices and you know social media things telling you that there is only one way to do it to have succeeded at yeah. being a mom like get the baby here safely you be okay baby be okay and that's that's all that matters so there's little nuggets isn't it mm-hmm. of, of, of wisdom that really that, that force their way through i can remember a friend of mine um said to me when i was uh pregnant with my first she said you don't get an extra medal Take yeah. an extra medal like You, you should. <laughs> <laughs> All the medals, please. <laughs> Doesn't matter how you bring your baby into the world, you know, you're not getting any anything extra. Exactly. Because, yeah. And I think it's about the experience for you. If it's important for you to do it a certain way or to, you know, to, to not use certain things, and that's amazing. If you feel great doing that, then that's great. But um yeah, I think the first time was a bit of a trial run for me and I knew exactly what I wanted the second time. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. (laughs) Uh, What was it like meeting your daughter for the first time? I really want to say that it was like this magical, amazing moment full of love because that's what everyone else says. (laughs) But I can remember her being kind of dropped on my chest and, you know, they're quite sort of wet and slippery and red. And I remember just thinking, oh, she looks a bit like a baby octopus. (laughs) (laughs) And then it was like, then she cried and then it was like this moment and, you know, she nuzzled in and started breastfeeding. And, you know, it was, it was really amazing. It was quite overwhelming as well. But that was my first thought was a little, I've got a little baby octopus on me. (laughs) All my dreams were true. It's an octopus. (laughs) My pregnancy dreams were wild. I literally, like, I had, I, I had dreams that I was giving birth to a cat. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> didn't happen? It didn't no. happen, no. But thank God it wasn't an octopus, because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think the first night is overwhelming as well, obviously. Yeah. And I don't think I was prepared for the, the pain of it all. You know, your womb starts contracting back. Yeah. And so that was quite painful. And I remember thinking, like, hold a minute here. We were told that birth was painful and then we were done. What is this? Um, so that was all quite a lot. Um, and it's just all a bit of a whirlwind, a bit of a blur. I completely you know what you're doing. forget about that stuff, though. You know, the fact that everything's kind of the ache of yeah. it as that, all that happens. I found those contractions qu- quite painful for me personally. I mean, again, everyone's everyone's body's different, but yeah. it, it was it was more just not expecting it and no mm-hmm. one had really told me about that, that I just didn't know what 
what I was what was going on really. Um, and you're just knackered, aren't you? You're just knackered, yeah. um, and you don't know what you're doing. And also, there was just that feeling that I'm sure most parents feel for the first time when they're just like, I just don't believe that someone thinks that I'm responsible enough to keep this human <laughs> being alive. Why? Why am I in charge? <laughs> Where's the person telling me what to do? I'm I'm the child, surely. But you're also put in that position of having to care for this little human who will mm. depend on you for everything when you are at your most depleted and most vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you're most tired. Yeah. As well. The, you know, the the sleep is something that you don't you can't prepare for, actually. Mm. And also that it's that if you choose to breastfeed, you know, that is such a minefield of information. Yeah. And, you know, there's I mean, some people do it very much more, you know, natural and just kind of on and off. And some people try and make it more structured. And I just feel there's so many options and so many things that can go wrong and, and be a challenge. Mm. And I I, no one told me about burping and that was like honestly no one of my biggest well I knew that you burped the baby yeah between during the feed but the things that could go wrong and with both my babies they would swallow like the most enormous amount of air and I got so much advice of like what to do and it was just something to do with the curve of the top of their mouths right and they would burp about I need to burp them about 20 times per th- feed it was exhausting and I just remember thinking like why like people talk about nappies and about the birth why has no one talked to me about the trauma of trying to get a burp out of baby so would you literally have to feed for a little while but like would the, I would feed and wait? then I would burp but then there'd be like the other burp and it was just like constantly constantly and then you know the baby's crying and uncomfortable yeah. and you're trying to put them down for the nap but there's just more air and more air and I had that yeah with both my babies just a, a lot of issues around that and it makes the feeds really long yeah and then they're exhausted and then you're exhausted and then they have to feed again and then they have to feed again and then when they're not feeding then you're pumping because you're trying to you know give yourself a break so someone else can give them a bottle at night so I think you know with hindsight I wish I'd I don't know I I don't know what I could have done I wish I'd just given myself a bit of a break on the breastfeeding as well because I was so did you have it in your mind that that's what you wanted to do yeah. And put pressure on yourself. I, I put so much pressure on myself and I, I didn't think I would be that way. I thought yeah. I'd be very just like, you know, a fed baby is a happy baby, right? Yeah. A happy mum, a happy baby. And if the baby's full and the tummy's full and they're getting the nutrients, that's what matters. But you just you just can't help reading little things here and there or hearing a comment here and there and then just feeling, again, it's, a, it's like with the birth, it's like you feel like if you don't do X, Y, Z, then you've somehow failed yourself. And it's just so couldn't be further from the truth Mm -hmm. because what children really need is a parent who is not distressed, who can look after them and give them love. And there's so many different ways to to feed a baby. And But I was so obsessive about I must breastfeed exclusively for X amount of time. And I really was on a bit of a blinkered path of it. And I remember with my first daughter, the doctor saying, well, she's losing weight and she's dropping percentiles. And, you know the anxiety around that well that's my fault because my only job is to feed her and I, she's not getting enough milk and I did the worst thing you can do as a new parent I bought scales to weigh the baby no yeah and I started weighing her not just every day but after every feed to check that she'd had enough milk. I mean it was just nuts and now I look back at it and I'm like what was I doing but then the second baby came along and I was like I am going to do it so differently like that was such a waste of time. Like she was fine. Mm. I remember there was this amazing lactation consultant and I was texting photos of my daughter going, they're saying that she's losing weight and I'm just not feeding her enough and like, should I give her for me? And she was like looking at the photos going, that baby's fine. Like she's got chunky little legs and chunky little rolls around her. Chin. Like she's fine. And I remember thinking with my second, I'm going to do this so differently. I'm going to be so chilled out. I'm just going to be like floating around, like pop her on the boob whenever and just... And I was exactly the same. Really? Exactly the same. I learned nothing from my past experiences. It was just something in me, like, with the feeding, just tapped into some something, I don't know, that I just felt like this is my job. I must feed them. They must only have breast milk. Well, and you never know how much they're getting. That's yeah, the thing with that's, breastfeeding. You just, you never know. That's the hardest thing. Yeah. That's, you know, you just reminded me because I remember at the time I, I really wanted to write this, like, bullet-pointed guide for parents that were really, really tired of, like, things... To help. And I remember thinking, like, you can't tell how much they've had, which is why I started weighing her after the feed. Because I thought then I could see how much she's had. I mean, were you making note of how much she weighed? Yeah. Yeah. I was, it was just, it was kind of obsessive. But, 
you know, you get through it. It's all a phase, isn't it? And you yeah. do get through it. And now, like, I'm talking to you and all these things are coming back. Like, I've forgotten all this stuff. Yeah. I've forgotten about the scales and the pumps and all that kind of stuff. And I, I just, I wish I had let myself off the hook a little bit more with that because I think I had a lot of anxiety at the time around it that wasn't needed. And, you know, like, like I said, there's just so many different ways to feed a baby. And as yeah. long as they're, as long as they're happy and you're happy, that's... That's what but counts. it's the pressure that you put on yourself. Absolutely. And especially you put on yourself, and I think society does have a lot to answer for. I think mums are held to such a standard and, you know, you're whatever you do, you're getting judged by somebody. We're judging ourselves, but we're also, we are being judged. And I think, you know, even if people don't criticise you for doing it a certain way, they praise you for doing it another way. Mm. Oh, well done. Oh, you're still breastfeeding. Well done, you. Mm -hmm. And so then that puts it in your head. Okay, well, if I stop, then I'm not getting that praise and I must be doing something wrong. So it's the, those little comments. I don't think people realise. Yeah. You know, even it's, you know, you can do it when someone has a baby and they lose a bit of weight. Oh, you're looking so great. Like, well, you think you're giving them a compliment, mm -hmm. right? But actually what you're telling them is, well, if you don't continue on that path, you're not doing well. And especially if you're a bit of a people pleaser and someone yeah. who's like looking for world validation mm -hmm. and up, um, <laughs> you know, you, you crave that kind of validation. And, oh, you're right. I'm doing something right. OK, I'm succeeding as a mum because this doctor's telling me, well done. You mm -hmm. know, this person's saying, oh, good for you, girl, you know, lucky baby. And it's just all those little comments that get in your skin. And I think I think as a whole, we as a society have a we should sort of stop and just think about how we talk to new mums and how we judge them. And I just think there's so much pressure that doesn't need to be there. And like I said, I come from a position where I had I had support, I had resources, and other people don't. And mm -hmm. I just feel so much empathy for those people who are just doing it on their own and then having the world looking at them and judging them for their choices. Did you get to a point with your breastfeeding that everything sort of settled? Um, with my first daughter, I, I breastfed her till she was 15 months old. And I, we got, I think it was about six months that suddenly, you know, she could sit up. Yeah. I don't know if I'm getting the timings a little bit wrong. Cause someone's going to be like, the babies can't sit up at six months. But I think it was around <laughs> when she started to be able to sit up that she could kind of burp herself. Yeah. And it was when the burping side of it, um, and the winding side of it kind of sorted itself out that suddenly it became easy for me mm. and it became enjoyable and it was like the nice cuddles at bedtime and in the morning so I really enjoyed my breastfeeding journey with her with with, with my second daughter I really was determined because I was like well the first one had this so the second one must have exactly the yeah. same but she's just such a different baby yeah and they were so different to each other and she just like didn't really want the boob she just I think, I don't know if it was the position or just, mm. she just knows what she wants. She's like an incredibly single-minded, in, like just this amazing little girl. And she knows exactly who she is and she knows exactly who she wants. And she just didn't really want the boob. And I was like, but she must have the boob. It's bonding and it's this and it's that. So what I ended up doing for her after a couple of months is I was like, okay, I'm not going to fight her anymore. Like this is now like ridiculous. <laughs> I'm just going to pump obsessively so then I was attached to a pump until 15 months because she had to have exactly the same as the first one <laughs> and I was things we oh, put in our head if I hear a sound of a breast pump <laughs> uh, 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 I have like flashbacks and I like have to go lie down because I was just hooked up to the pump all the yeah. time and then the washing and the sterilizing so it's yeah, a whole other thing yeah. but yeah um so yeah they were very different very different journeys and that is that is the other thing you learn and I feel like it's almost like so obvious that why didn't I know this? Because everyone else knows this. But I really, really thought that the way my first daughter was, was like so down to what I'd done. And I was like, <laughs> she is just, you know, like she didn't have tantrums at two. And mm. I was like, this is just because I am this very calm parent who's instilled this amazing like character in my child. And like she ate really, really well until she was two. And again, I was like, well, if you give your child a very varied diet at the beginning and you did it, you know, pat, pat, pat comes the second one a whole different story and I was like well more for me for being that smug parent who thought that I was nailing it I wasn't nailing it I just got lucky mm. and my second one was a whole different story and both of them when they got to two went from being really good eaters to like I only wanted to eat bread and cheese and pasta like <laughs> and you know and again I was like okay here I am like saying to the parents like yeah it's just that I give them these really amazing like rainbow meals and then I'm like okay now I'm the parent who's like <laughs> the please <page. laughs> please eat one piece of pasta please and you can have 
loads of ice cream you just have <laughs> one piece of the pasta like I'm that parent now and so and it's just it's a really good like it's a really good just wake up call to me like don't judge any other parent on yeah. anything they do because firstly that could be you in mm-hmm. a month's time you just don't know they change so fast and secondly like it, it's just a lot of it's down to the luck of the draw <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean I know that I found myself in times where you know I've got a child that's maybe acting in a way that's a bit more challenging you mm-hmm. know and then you're looking at other people's kids who are so nice and calm and eating everything or sleeping all the time and actually it changes everything, yeah. whatever, you know, it's the whole this teacher past thing, no matter what they're doing, whether it's whether it's a time where everything's going really well and everyone's happy, it will always go. And also, I think there's just a pick your battles moment as well. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of a lot of parenting I find as well is, you know, going, please don't do this. Don't do that. You know, so we must knows. do it this way. Yeah. And like, it's kind of counter to what, who I think I am, which is the live your best life. Yeah. Like you just enjoy like, you know anarchy you know <laughs> that's how I've tried to kind of live my own life just like this real freedom and so then to suddenly be telling these little people like no you mustn't do that and you must so I've tried to kind of pick my battles a little bit so that it's not a constant don't do this and yeah. so things like you know I see other kids and they sit really nicely and eat their meals or oh, my kids are rolling on the floor <laughs> like with their pants in the air and like food on their hair and I'm just like you know what you want to roll like walk around the room when you eat and graze fine and I'm sure I will get judged in the restaurant for it but they're having a good time and we put some music on and have a dance and like meal times have become more fun mm-hmm. and so for us that's what works and I just, is it that is it like embracing it then rather than fighting against every move kind yeah. of embracing the fact they are kids they are kids and I think my partner's such a like fun time dad and he's magical and he kind of makes even like the silliest little moments you know having breakfast like a real moment Mm. and I think I've just like really leaned into that and just gone like this is amazing like we're getting to you know have porridge and it's funny and it's fun and we're wearing silly hats and we're dancing and that's okay like Mm -hmm. maybe someone else's kids are going to have a little you know a few more spoonfuls of porridge because they're sat and it's going to be quicker and they're eating it properly and they're digesting it properly (laughs) but um, you know my kids are having a lot of fun so I'm just like well I'm just going to lean into that and kind of stop myself being the don't do that mum yeah <laughs> also if you think back to your Devon days and that feeling of being a kid and having that freedom mm. you know you almost you want to grab that and give it to your kids yeah and you know obviously there's there's a downside to it right because your kids are rolling around on the floor eating or someone's got to clean up that mess afterwards <laughs> right <laughs> although they've got to the age now where I'm like we're going to do it together it's a game <laughs> it's a game called clean clean the restaurant and they, 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 buy they love it they wow. I mean like, it, it will only last so long until they realize that I am hoodwinking them <laughs> and that actually they're cleaning up mess but for them now they think it's like this like role play game of like we run a restaurant and we I clean our that. tables and the floor down and stuff I love that. And also, oh, you have the, kids, isn't it? So they can end up doing the dishwasher. <laughs> well, Mary Poppins did it. So, you know, she got them doing stuff. I was collect- we, we do have chickens and, and our kids collected the eggs today and then they watered all the plants. And I was like, this is a good moment. I'm going to leave the house now because I feel like I'm winning. It's already all fallen to pot since I've left. But that felt really good, getting them to do those things. Well, that sounds magical. Well, you know, last night was an awful bedtime. So the least they could do is collect eggs today and, you know, water the plants. So your eldest is now in school. Yes. How has this new chapter been? I love it. You know what? She's she's having such a good time. She's having so much fun. And that is the main thing. We chose a school that we thought was going to give her fun and joy and happiness above all else. And she's just having a wonderful time. And she's met some really lovely kids. And I actually really surprised myself with the friendships I've made in this first year with the other parents as well. I didn't think I would. I was very kind of like, I have my friends and I'm done. Yeah. And I'm good, thanks. And actually there's these amazing people and these amazing women. And I they've we've just become this like support network for each other. Mm. It's like this whole new little community. Um so I've loved that. I've really loved that. Yeah, I love that. It's a whole new chapter though. It's a whole new I feel like once they get to that point, it's like, oh, there you are for years now. Like your life is dictated to by some like school yeah. holidays. Yeah. It is. And I do like I don't I don't mean to be soppy about it, but I do miss her as well a lot. Yeah. You know, I miss she said to me the other day, because I take my little one and you know, I, I she does nursery a few mornings a week, but we have mummy mama days. And my five said, Well why don't I get a mama day? And I was like, Well you do because I pick you up some 
afternoons and then we have like time just me and you she's like yeah, but i want a whole mama day and i was like yeah okay holidays are coming we can do that <laughs> <laughs> and you're still really busy like i feel like with you uh from what, what you've told me as well when like, having kids being pregnant that's your time to really get creative you don't yeah. you don't ease off well i so i did ease off in some ways as in i stopped all my formal work yeah so i stopped all my kind of commitments in a way and i i had a break from mm. all of that but I still, I found myself wanting to prove to myself I could still think. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really strange, but I really wasn't sure I could. I was <laughs> like, I don't know if my brain works anymore. And I remember with my second daughter, she was on the boob. We're having a breastfeed and I was sitting there. She was about three weeks old and I, and I had the pump next to me and I was looking at the pump sort of with deep hatred for this pump. And I was just thinking, am I just a milk machine? Is that what I am? A sort of human cow. <laughs> and that's all I'll ever be. And, you know, in that moment, you can't see yeah. out of anything but that moment. And I was like, do you know what? I've, I'm just going to see if I can write something. And I'd had this idea for a children's book for some time. And I just got my phone out while she was sort of there on me. And I, I got the notes part of my phone and I just started typing mm. a story um, a kid's story about a bee with pink stripes. And um, I typed it all out and I was like, no, that's ridiculous. Nothing will ever come of it. And then um, I read it to my best mate and she was like, this is good. This is really good. And um, I sent it to, I've got a literary agent mm -hmm. who done my first book from the podcast and he was like, I love it. And so he just sent it around and yeah, that's how that's how that book came about new book baby new book babu the unusual bee so that's that's coming out in september and i think that really was me kind of trying to challenge myself to be a human other than a mum because yeah. it was my second child as well i knew how much of yourself you give to your children and how much i don't want to say you lose yourself but you you have to kind of park part of yourself yeah. for a while and they need so much and they want so much and they're asking so much and you, and you feel like you're constantly being asked for things in certain ways when they're when they're babies it's through cries and then when mm -hmm. they can talk it's through just asking and pulling on you <laughs> um and so i just wanted to kind of prove that i was still a living person with my own mind and thoughts <laughs> and do that um and then with my first baby i i directed my first short film a week before i gave birth so that was an interesting choice yeah. but I think it was just the way the cards fell and yeah. um and then obviously she came and we had to shoot one more day so I just sort of had her in a little strapped onto me in a little um what are they called the little sling yeah and um we went and did that and then we had the first year I kind of had to edit it but it was nice because it was there was no time scale we were making the short film for ourselves and we didn't have a deadline so it was kind of like as and when and it's nice to have something to kind of go occasionally and just be away from the chaos mm -hmm. of the new baby so I took my time I mean it took a, a year for me to edit a 10 minute short film with our amazing editor and my best mate and um and so it was I was really lucky to be able to just take that time but have something mm -hmm. so I didn't feel like I was solely dedicated to other people that I had something just for me if you could write a letter on motherhood who would it be to and what would you say I think I I would I want to say that I'd write it to my daughters because I think that's the that's the nice thing to do, isn't it? That's the motherly thing to do. But I think but. <laughs> I would write it to my younger self yeah, and just say, just give yourself a break. Stop worrying about what everyone else thinks. This is the moment in your life to be in your own bubble with your mm. own family and stop worrying about the, the external world. It doesn't matter what they think and it doesn't matter you know, if they think you're doing it right or wrong and just enjoy as much as you can the moment, whatever that looks like for you, whether it's whether it's working, whether it's staying home, whether it's trying to juggle, like just enjoy it and stop. I'm, I'm such a people pleaser and I just yeah. wish I hadn't been when it was with my own little family because yeah. it's such a magical moment in a way. It's so hard, but you can't get that time back. And I feel like that's almost an annoying thing to say because it's like the pressure then to enjoy it. But it, it does go fast and... I think that's what I would just say. Just just give yourself a break. Mm. Don't be so hard on yourself and just um, do it your way. Yeah, I like that. Uh, and we end the podcast with you completing three sentences. Okay. <laughs> the first one is being a mum means. Being a mum means having to rethink what it means to be a good human. Mm. 
And I think that's because it can get quite philosophical, the discussions you have with children when they start questioning, but why do I have to do things this way? Yeah. And it's things we accept because we've been taught them as children. But when you break it down, you go, well, maybe maybe we don't. Or you have to really think about why. And it becomes, it can get quite deep. You know, why do I have to share my toys? But then if someone else has something, I can't just take it and share it with them. You know, just why can I be in my pants on the beach, but not in school? It, all these sort of <laughs> things that don't really make sense when you yeah. look at them. So I think it's a really amazing chance to rethink the rules of life and yeah. question them for yourself so um yeah I'm really grateful to my kids for that <laughs> uh, since having children I have washed a lot less <laughs> <laughs> I've probably stunk a lot more um I think I, I saw someone on Instagram saying they understand why I think it was daddy bear's porridge was hot too hot <laughs> mummy bear's porridge was too cold and baby bear's was just right and I think it's that thing of you just you 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 do put yourself last yeah. um and I think all parents probably do to some extent but you end up just sort of like forgetting a little bit and I think that that is one thing that is quite important to remember is that parenthood is a is a journey but remember to take yourself along for the ride mm. because you can forget that you are an individual person at the same time and you can give so much of yourself away mm. and so trying to take a little piece of you on that motherhood journey I think um, yeah it's really important and finally I'm happy when I'm happy when I wake up in the morning and my kids jump on me for the morning cuddles Aww. and just kiss me all over my face and say love you mama that is honestly my my happiest moment and it's just the nicest way to be woken up in the morning that's lovely I just get a, can I go downstairs now <laughs> Listen, yes. sometimes I get a boot in the face and they're <laughs> farting on me and, you know, that happens too. But when it's the morning cuddles and the love you mamas, that to me is um, bliss. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. My mornings are, um, uh, the, can I go downstairs now? And then I go downstairs. Now at the age where they make themselves a little bit of breakfast. Stunning. I feel like that's that's when you just can, like, relax, surely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'll go have a shower. I'll come down. Look, it's all good. Can they make you breakfast, though? That's no, the, that's so the important part. whether I want a bowl of Cheerios or not. That's, that's the real <laughs> you question. You need to teach them to do a fry-up next, yeah. and then you've nailed it. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much, Birdie. That was amazing. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you.